Hello, my name is Matthias Muhr. I'm a grad student in the lab of Johannes Zuber at the IMP in Vienna. And today I would like to show you how we use SLAMSEQ for measuring rapid changes in gene expression. Transcriptional regulation governs virtually all processes in a living cell. Recent advances in deep sequencing technologies have made transcriptomic techniques like RNA sequencing widely accessible. Transcriptomics can also be used as an exploratory tool, for example, to study responses to drugs. When designing such experiments, it's really important to keep in mind that transcription itself is a highly dynamic process. It all starts with the multi-step assembly of transcription machinery at a genes promoter. Then an RNA polymerase can initiate transcription and is eventually released into the gene body for processive elongation. When fully active, polymerases traverse genes at a speed of roughly 2 kilobases per minute. This means that transcription of some large genes can take up to 30 minutes or even more. Once transcription and RNA processing are completed, a typical messenger RNA is exported from the nucleus. The fate of mRNAs in the cytoplasm varies from transcript to transcript. Some RNAs, for example, encoding for transcription factors, are known to have half-lives of 30 minutes or less, while others remain stable for up to hours or even days. These timelines have important implications for measuring transcriptional changes. If we perform RNA-seq immediately after perturbing a cell, it is impossible to detect effects on stable transcripts and our analysis will be heavily biased towards a few short-lived RNAs. On the other hand, measuring several hours after perturbing a cell makes it impossible to say what is a direct consequence of manipulating a cell and what is just a secondary effect. So rather than looking at total RNA levels in the cell, we would rather look at changes in mRNA output. Now this can be done with different techniques that use so-called metabolic labeling. So what we do is that we add 4SU to our cells and the cells will take it up and incorporate it into transcripts just like any other uridin. Then, after a defined period of time, we can harvest our cells and isolate RNA, which will contain a mixture of the old, unlabeled RNAs and of the new RNAs that contain 4SU. At this point, several techniques have been developed to isolate specifically the labeled RNA, which usually involves laborious purification steps and also large amounts of input material. As an alternative and very elegant approach, um, the lab of Stefan Meres at Imber here in Vienna has recently developed a technique they called SLAMSEQ. They applied a very simple chemical trick, which relies on the alkylation of 4SU with uracetamide. What this does is that if now a reverse transcriptase hits a modified 4SU residue, it will interpret this residue like a C instead of a U. These conversions can then be identified directly in deep sequencing reads as those typical T to C conversions. Thereby, newly synthesized RNAs actually become directly visible within the total RNA pool in deep seq samples. Hearing about this approach, we were very excited to adopt it for measuring rapid changes in mRNA output. This allowed us to study direct effects of drug treatments and chemical genetic perturbations in cancer cells, which we published in a recent study, which you can read up here. We've applied this technique now in many different experimental settings, but in all cases, it roughly looked like this. We pre-treat our cells with a drug or some fast-acting perturbation, like a chemical genetic perturbation, then we label newly synthesized RNAs directly afterwards and then perform SLAMSEQ to identify the newly synthesized RNAs in treated and untreated cells. Over the course of those studies, we learned a lot about how to best perform a SLAMSEQ experiment, but one very important lesson that we learned is that it's actually very simple. And how simple it really is, is something I would like to now show you in practice. So we, of course, start off our experiment with perturbing our cells in cell culture. This can be basically anything like a drug treatment, a cytokine stimulation, or even a chemical genetic technique. The one thing that is important is that it acts fast. 
So you can imagine that classical genetic tools like RNA interference or knockouts that often take hours or days to work are not compatible with our fast slam -seek experiments. Today we're going to look at the effects of a CDK9 inhibitor in a leukemia cell line. Here we have two cultures of roughly 3 million happily growing leukemia cells from a cell line. We will now treat one of those with the CDK9 inhibitor and leave the others untreated as a reference. Now we let our cells incubate again for another 30 minutes. This is important. Although we know that CDK9 inhibitors directly affect transcription, we want to have at least 30 minutes for ongoing transcription to run off. This actually has been um, a very useful timeline for also other perturbations. But of course, if you're studying a drug where you expect slower effects, you might have to wait longer accordingly. Next, we add 4SU to label newly transcribed RNAs. It is important to note that 4SU is photosensitive, so we'll have to turn off the light in our cell culture hoods. And also, later on in the wet lab, you will see we will protect our samples from direct light exposure. Now we add 100 micromolar of 4SU to each of our cell cultures. We then incubate the cells for another hour to let them incorporate the label into newly synthesized RNAs. Of course, you can also change this duration and concentrations. For example, if you increase the labeling time, you will get more numbers of converted read in the end, of course. And if you want to increase temporal resolution, you can shorten the labeling time. If you start off with this technique for the first time or if you try a new cell line, I would highly recommend to first do a small experiment and sequence some million reads just to get an idea of the labeling efficiency. You can also use one of the many cell lines that we know work really well for SLAMSeq as a positive control. And you can see a list of those cell lines shown down here. Now we only have to harvest our cells and extract the RNA. At this point, it's important to keep the timing precise, and for this, we just snap freeze ourselves. Now we perform an RNA extraction um, with basically any RNA extraction method that you prefer to use in the lab. We personally like to use a commercial column purification kit. The one thing that is important to note is that our samples are still light sensitive. So we have to protect it from direct light um, on the one hand by covering our samples and wherever possible, we also shield it with constructions like these. Now that we extracted the RNA, we can continue with the alkylation process. We simply mix a master mix of uroacetamide for alkylation and an appropriate buffer. It has to be noted that also the uroacetamide is photosensitive, so at this point we still work light protected. Then we add our master mix to roughly 5 microgram of each sample and incubate it on the heat block at 50 degrees for 15 minutes. Now that the reaction is complete, we simply stop it by adding a reducing agent. From now on, the product of this reaction is not light sensitive anymore, so we can handle it like any other RNA sample. We next simply purify this RNA by a standard ethanol precipitation protocol. So now that we repurified our RNA after alkylation, we can basically handle our samples like for any other RNA sequencing protocol. However, for SLAMSeq it is important to get high coverage on those rare newly synthesized transcripts. For this reason, we prefer to use a commercial um, deep sequencing kit that allows us to only sequence three prime tags of our transcripts. It is also important to use a sequencing platform with high throughput and high quality. 
um, so that you get good coverage on your converted bases. We therefore also recommend to sequence for at least 100 base pairs so that you cover many T positions and get a good signal to noise ratio. Now once all the deep sequencing is finished, we can look at our primary data. For this specific experiment of the leukemia cell line, we know that sequencing roughly 45 million reads per sample gives us sufficient depth to cover a large portion of the transcriptome. Initially, the primary sequence analysis of SLAMSeq data was quite challenging because, of course, we introduce mismatches on the one hand, but on the other hand, we don't want our results to be affected by natural sequence variations such as SNPs. Now, luckily, for all of those primary data analysis steps, Tobias Neumann from our lab, together with Philipp Reschen, Eda and others, has developed a full analysis pipeline that covers all of those steps of primary sequence analysis down to read counting. They termed this analysis pipeline Slam Dunk, and you can actually download Slam Dunk and read a detailed documentation of all the analysis steps under the link shown down here. Slamdunk provides you with a lot of different outputs, such as um, very elaborate quality control plots and, of course, also the mapping results. But what we want to look at now is the read counts to really quantify changes in mRNA output. So here you can see the table just for the untreated cells. And you can see the normalized reads of the total RNA and specifically of the SLAMSIG reads, which in this case are the reads that have at least two T to C conversions. Now you can appreciate that the fraction of the labeled reads among total reads is very different between different genes. And that's actually exactly what we expect. So if you, for example, look at such a transcription factor here, we have a very high incorporation rate corresponding to a high transcript turnover. Whereas other housekeeping genes shown here, for example, have relatively low labeling efficiencies. But now we, of course, want to look at the changes in SLAMSeq signal upon CDK9 inhibition. So if we compare the reads for our inhibitor-treated cells with the untreated cells, you can see that there's a massive drop in signal for all of those genes. And this is actually true for all genes globally, which is very much what we expect for a CDK9 inhibitor that broadly affects transcription. This is actually one important feature of SLAMSeq. We have both the old and the new RNA sequenced together. So we can use the old unlabeled RNA as a reference, basically like a spag in, to see absolute changes in transcription levels. You can of course also perform conventional differential gene expression analysis. We for example use the DSEC2 package. So as you can see, SLAMSIG is a really simple and at the same time powerful method to study all types of rapid cellular perturbations. We've used it for example to study drugs, but also drug synergies and very basic functions of transcription factors. So I hope this video helped some of you to get started with your first SLAMSeq experiments and wish you all the best.